All right, so what I wanna talk about for the next 14 minutes and 40, 39, 38 seconds is how building APIs is getting even easier if you have SQL Server or Azure SQL Database or Azure SQL MI. If you've grabbed the QR code or that URL, you've now become part of a somewhat not really massively online multiplayer game. What this is, it is the demo that we're going to look at today. In the upper right corner is the About button. So if you're kind of like, wow, graphic design is not his thing, um, and you want to skip right to the code, um, you can just hit the About button in the upper right corner. You'll be able to get to the demo code and look at it later, pick out the anti-patterns that I used, but then see the boilerplate code that helps you out along the way. What I want to talk about, though, behind that are the SQL bindings for Azure Functions. If you're building APIs, if you're building applications on Azure, chances are you've come across Azure Functions because they're great in how they're scalable. There's so many different deployment options, whether it's by region or the, uh, the scalability up and out. Now, when you're working with Azure Functions, you could be using C Sharp, JavaScript, Java, Python, PowerShell. It's kind of a choose your own adventure. Like you pick the hammer you're used to hitting things with and you use that in Azure Functions. Now I'm not, not a dumb person. I know that most of you do use .NET, so awesome. But no matter what language you use in Azure Functions, all of what we're talking about today is going to apply to you still. With SQL bindings, instead of needing to pick out the, the driver for SQL, you're able to pass the object from the function in and out of SQL, kind of like an integration point. So instead of opening the connection, handling the connection results, doing all kinds of stuff, hopefully closing the connection, um, you, you just have a decorator on your function that says, this is the query I'm going to run. This is the stored procedure I'm going to run. Here's the object. Now I'm going to do something with it. What I just described is an input binding. So the object comes into the function, it's out of the SQL database. An output binding works in the other direction. You define a decorator on your function, and you say at the end of this function, this object, this array, should get upserted into my database. So an insert or an update based on the primary key of that uh, table. Now, there's a lot of really intricate things that we'll look at here in a minute when you're talking about input and output bindings, so many different flexible ways to use them. But the other thing that I don't want to skip over is the SQL trigger capability. Trigger and SQL are two words that when you put them together make a lot of people go, oh no. And so I want to be really clear that the SQL trigger for Azure Functions is Azure Functions checking for changes in SQL based on change tracking in SQL. So it's checking at a designated interval, default of every one second, for changes in SQL, super lightweight on the SQL side, cheap. And then you're able to bring those in very performantly. So we're talking like sub-second time frame into your Azure Functions. So this is not like one millisecond response, this is sub-second response, but then you're bringing your changes into your Azure function and being able to respond to it immediately with those changes. Okay, I have wasted four minutes talking about the concepts. Now we're gonna demo. This is the game that you ended up on. This is a little bit of a game of tag where we have a game board and a controller and we, we can move around. So if I move up, I see a couple of you are around. Player can set their game piece. The front end, I used Blazor because, hey, I work for Microsoft. And the, the back end are APIs that I built in Azure Functions. The, the kind of most fundamental thing we saw on that page was the game board. I'll blow this up even bigger because it's a super simple Azure function. If you're familiar with Azure Functions, a lot of this looks familiar. You're like, oh yeah, that's an HTTP trigger. It responds when a GET request is made to slash API slash board state. This all makes sense. I'm getting the state for the board. In this function, I want to run a stored procedure in my database called GET board state. Now, normally, I would grab SQL client and I would do a bunch of things to run this query, passing in some parameters that I'm getting out of the query string on the, uh, the, the request that came in. But in this case, because of SQL bindings, my function has a single line of code. <laughs> it's kind of anticlimactic. I apologize for this, the simplicity of this first example. But what we have on line 16 there 
is it's giving it the stored procedure name. It's saying, hey, this is a stored procedure. And then the parameters that I'm passing in for x location and y location on my stored procedure are coming from the query string x and y. It's passing that in to an enumerable, an array for the board state so we can see the different squares and then how many players are in those squares around it. Now, you're, you're seeing there's, there's no authentication, there's no validation. This is a really, really simple example to get you started on the concept of I have this decorator on the function and now I'm getting results back. I have a local, uh, local database, a local test environment, so I'm just gonna do func start real quick so that we can test these APIs out locally and you can kind of see the responses in real time. Cool. So I'm gonna check on my local machine who's at zero, zero, or around zero, zero. So to the left of zero, zero, there is nobody, and I get this little array back from the database. But that's a really nice way to just start building APIs. Now, that was a little bit over simple. What if I wanna get more information about a user? I am a user, I've loaded this page, you know, I got that I'm the color green. How, how would I do that? And what if I wanted to do some validation, maybe based on the headers that came over, by my user ID and my, my pass key there? This is where I want to introduce the concept of imperative bindings. These are kind of a lesser known thing, but the pattern emerges really quickly when you work with SQL and Azure Functions. And in this case, instead of having a decorator at the top of the function, I have that I binder line. And so this is where I can bring in the imperative bindings later in the function. First, I want to parse the headers and grab my user ID and my pass key and make sure that I can parse those before I then do things like run a stored procedure to get information about that user. So now on line 28, we're now using a SQL info binding, still not trying to like open a connection, run a query, handle result set, still none of that just declaring the binding, and then using the info list enumerable, enumerable that comes out of it to pass that back. So still, really quick result, still like 20 lines of code, kind of exciting. I've only been doing get requests, so you're probably like, eh. What if I wanna update the color? You saw that drop down where it's like, all right, I want to be yellow now. What does that look like? If I set my HTTP route to patch, now I can do the same things I did before where I was parsing the header. I can do the same kind of uh, imp imperative uh, imp input binding, but at the top on line 21, we have an output binding. We remember the output bindings are where I wanna write to a table. So I wanna update my users table with new information so what that looks like in the function is when I get my user information and then I get ready to pass it back by the end by adding it to my output to table object. I can, let's see here, what's my, so I was green before at two, two. Let's be yellow. I'm yellow, I'm gonna run the get request just in case you don't believe me, I'm still yellow, cool. All right, now what if I wanna move a player? You have undoubtedly noticed that there was the big controllers at the bottom where I had left and right and up and down. If I pass that to a player move API where I say player move slash left, when that happens, I need to update the user's score. Maybe they've tagged some other players, maybe, um, maybe they aren't allowed to move at this point. We've introduced permissions or other restrictions into our game. I need to do a lot of checks involved here. When I do the player move, I've got a traditional input binding. So we've seen this before, but before it was a stored procedure. You can declare your queries right inside your Azure function. This is especially common in ETL type scenarios talking about app development here, but hey, these SQL bindings are great for if you need to do kind of data pipeline loading through Azure Functions, so you can declare your queries right in there. We also have an output binding to the scoreboard. So by the end of this function, we're able to update the scoreboard. 
within the function, I'm going to run a stored procedure. Now, I'm going to look at a little bit of T-SQL for a moment, just because I want to point something out about this stored procedure. In this move user stored procedure, I'm inserting to a moves table. I'm logging these moves as they happen. Perhaps I want to introduce some AI into my game to add AI characters that move around based on other players' moves. Perhaps I want to keep an eye and monitor for malicious activity. There's something that I want to be able to do on the data post real time. I update the user's location. I find out how many people they tagged. I move on. So what if I do want to respond to things that happen in that moves table? SQL trigger. Now, I want the player moves to happen just about instantaneously. I don't want anything to slow it down, but I want something else to happen fairly instantaneously and catch up after the fact. In this case, we're going to watch for players' moves, and when they tag someone, we're going to pick them at random, and we're going to give them a rainbow. Again, graphics design is not really my thing, so you just kind of have to bear with me. So if I want to introduce a SQL trigger, instead of an HTTP trigger, we have a SQL trigger. We tell it this is the table and this is the connection string, very similar to input and output bindings. The only other caveat is that you enable change tracking on your Azure SQL database, Azure SQL Managed Instance, or SQL Server 2016 through 2022. This is like one of the few sessions at Build where someone's going to stand up on stage and say, you do not have to use the newest thing to do this. You could be on SQL Server 2016 and still use SQL Trigger as long as you have Azure connectivity. So with my SQL Trigger watching the moves table, I bring in every change. I say, you know what, I don't care about updates or deletes. If someone's messing with this table, I don't want to run this trigger. I only want to run it when things are inserted. So I can say, just check for the insert change operations. Now I'm going to use additional bindings on this function. So we're mixing and matching SQL bindings a lot. So you can use an input binding, you can use an output binding all in the same function. I'm getting the user's location to find out more information about them before I then find out who else was on that square. If multiple people are on that square, now I'm going to be looking for the output binding to update their scoreboard. We can do this in real time if I open up an incognito window. Actually, let me start my static web app. We are going to make this work in two minutes. The pressure is so I'm going to go to localhost 4280 in this window. I'm at 05. I've opened up another one. The user IDs are uniquely generated and placed in the cookies. Both of these have connected to the signal R endpoint that is being triggered by that SQL trigger. So both the um, incognito window and my non-incognito window. And so when in the incognito window I move up to 05, we see the green player. This is the non-incognito window. I tag them. Let's go back to the in We have a rainbow. We got tagged. And I still have a minute left. Wow, that happened way too fast. Um, so that is how quickly your SQL trigger can fire and then pass things on to, in this case, the very trendy signal R endpoint. Now, we can even see some of that happening in our API log to get an idea of how quickly that happened. I already missed it. SQL trigger process to request. Right there. So we're seeing that happen in um, that's like 50 milliseconds, something like that. Um, now this is all local on my machine, but you're still co-locating things in Azure data centers for your sanity, and so you're still going to see similar time frames if you are playing along on your cell phone now or maybe later tonight at the mixer. Um, you may find that you are getting rainbows it also in sub-second time. Thank you all. I really appreciate your attention. I hope you find this useful.